لتعجيل فرج المولى صاحب العصر والزمان وحفظ وجود الشريعة فنحمل رفع صوته بذكر محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى ابنتك مكسورة الأضلاع المضطرة بين الحائط والباب لا سيما على آل بيتك الطيبين الطاهرين لعن الله الظالمين لكم سادتي من الأولين والآخرين صلى الله عليك يا مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا غريب يا مظلوم كربلاء كربلاء سيدي ما خاب من تمسك بكم ومن من لجأ إليكم يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز فوزا عظيما يقول الله تبارك وتعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما خلقت الجن والجن والإنس إلا ليعبدون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد الله سبحانه وتعالى says in the holy book in the Quran I only created jinn and mankind to worship me. We always mention this verse and the talk about the purpose of existence continues. Ya'budun in this verse, some of the ex people, some of the scholars who explain this verse, they said Ya'budun means Ya'rifun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us to worship him and in another words, to know him. Knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like a chain. It's not only that you have to know Allah and you can, you are able to do it directly. There are few things that you have to gather in your aqidah in order to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And why did I say a chain? Because usually when I want to buy a chain that I need to pull a car with it, I need to hang something on it, the thicker I buy the chain, the stronger it is. The more I take care of this chain, try to uh, keep the rust away from it, the firm it is, the more firm it is, and the stronger it stays and it will serve me for, for a longer time. So I try to buy a thick chain, a strong chain, and I always take care of this chain. There are a lot of common points between this chain and the chain that we are supposed to have in order to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like when we recite in the dua, Allahumma arifni nafsak, O oh Allah guide me to know you. This is the first chain. Because if you don't guide me to know you, I won't know your messenger. O oh Allah guide me to know your messenger. Because if you don't guide me to know your messenger, I won't know your proof on earth. O oh Allah, guide me to know your proof on earth. Because if you don't, I will be deviated from my religion. So it's a chain. You have to know, in order to know Allah, you have to know his messenger. In order to know his messenger, you have to know his proof. And who are the proof? 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth, Ahlul Bayt, Muhammad wa Al-Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. They are 14, and one of them is Sayyida Fatima al-Zahra alayha salam. Now we can see the importance of commemorating her martyrdom, not just her martyrdom, talking about her life, about her tragedies, about what saddens her, about what makes her happy, how it is really connected to our aqidah. Some people would say, why do you have to talk about it? It's something that's simple. We have more priorities in religion. No, it's very connected, firmly connected to our aqidah. And in order to know her, we have to stand up for her, commemorate her tragedy, show the world the oppression that happened on her. And inshallah, in the, what I'm going to say next is going to prove that, how it is very connected to our religion. Some people, now tonight I chose to answer some questions that usually brought up when we talk about Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam because people might say that this would cause uh, a disunity between the Muslims. In fact, stating history is never against taqiyya, is never something that can cause disunity. We, as we can see, all of our scholars in their books, they state history clearly because it's history, something that's, that's really need to be mentioned. It's our identity. As a Shi'i, your Existence, your identity is your history that's related to not just to the civilizations, it's even the, what's related to your aqidah, your belief, what you believe in. In one scene of a movie that I saw, you know, in the olden times in the Western country, uh, whoever is accused by uh, performing witchery, doing like, like wizards or witches, whoever is accused by doing that they are hanged or burned. And in a cer certain interval of time, they gave those who are accused by, uh, of being a witcher or a wizard, uh, they give them options either to sign off your name and admit that you are uh, doing these acts or you have to be hanged. Most of them, of course, refuse to sign off their names. One of, a very, one of the scenes that is very touching this man started to cry. He started to say, how can you ask me such a thing? I only get to have one name in my life. This is me. This, is, this proves my presence in this world. If you take off my name, my dignity goes. I have no value anymore. Eventually, he refuses and they hang him like everyone else. So this is our identity. Not only we stand up for it in order to protect our existence, we have to stand up for it, for the sake of Ahlul Bayt, for the sake uh, of the religion, and for the sake of the next generation. If we really love the next generation, our kids, and we want to see them in heaven on the day of judgment, we have to stand up for what's right. We have to stand up for our identity and our beliefs. And unfortunately, when I say that I need to answer some questions and misconceptions that are brought up, whenever this occasion comes, we used to answer this que these questions for people from another sect or from other religions. Unfortunately, now we have to answer for our own people. People who claims that they want the fake unity. What do I mean by fake unity? Fake unity is when you try to, su to submit to others and try to let down some of your beliefs. And this is not unity. If you do that, sometimes they do that for worldly purposes, political purposes, or to have some of their properties in the country, in the heart of the country of the other sects. In fact, our religion and our sect is the real sect that preaches for unity. How? There was a social exp experiment that was done, one of them in Iraq, one of them in Algeria or Tunisia, I'm not sure. So in the Arba'in in Iraq, where there was Mawakib, a man who came, he came, who came to one of the mawakib and claimed to be a Sunni. And he stood, he, he came, he said, I need to pray, I need to use the toilets and water, I'm hungry. Can you feed me? They said, yes, you are welcome. He said, but I'm a Sunni. 
They said, yeah, it's all right. You are more than welcome. You come and pray and you do whatever you want. And they offered him everything that they could of water and food and everything and even a place to sleep. Another video that I saw on YouTube, and you can search it as well and you can find it, that this person in Algeria, he's a Sunni, but he claimed to be searching for a Husseiniya. He said, can I find a Husseiniya in this area? Most of them, they frowned in his face and they left. But some of them, they stood up. Even one of them said, said it clearly. They say, he said, are you a Shi'i? He said, yes. He said, if we are not on the street in front of people, I would have killed you. So unity is when we are raised by Ahlul Bayt sallallahu alayhi in a way that everyone around us feels safe. And this is who we are. Unity, when it affects our beliefs and the beliefs of the next generation, it's not required anymore. It's haram, in fact. Even taqiyya, all the scholars, they agree on it becomes haram when it affects my beliefs. Because if I keep doing it, the next generation will start to believe it. So it becomes haram when it affects our belief. So some questions need to be answered because we face a lot of misconceptions. People, they try to hide it. They try to, because it's a crime against humanity. So now if someone threatens you, only threatens you, you call the police and they would make a, a case out of it. It's something that's wrong. But when you see a crime that wasn't only just threatening, it was an attack and burning, trying to suffocate the kids and the women inside the house, we need to stand up for it. We need to tell people that what happened is wrong. So one of the questions that are asked, they say that the event of Sayyidah Zahra, sallallahu wa sallam, just another point before starting, sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala. There is a Christian priest, if you write his name on Google, his name is Christopher Paul Clohesy. Probably some of you heard of him. You saw some videos of him on YouTube. If you write his name down on Google, the first thing that will come up is two books that he wrote. One book that's called Fatima Dora of Muhammad, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, and the other is called Half of My Heart, which is a book about Sayyidah Zainab sallallahu wa sallam. And we had an interview with this priest a few days ago. And he mentioned at the end, while he was talking about Sayyidah Zainab, the attack on the house of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra. Isn't it a shame that a person who doesn't share our beliefs, when he saw this lady and her status that is mentioned in history, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alayhi, isn't it a shame that he would write about her and defend her and show the world the oppression that she went through and people from our sect, they just keep silent about it. And even after he finished, some people objected. They said, like, how come he mentioned the attack on Sayyidah Fatima al-Zara and it's not even authentic in our narrations? And this man, he doesn't benefit anything from any sect in Islam. He just wrote what's right. His opinion is neutral. He's not biased. So, people who try to hide this for the sake of unity or for the sake of I don't know what reasons, they would say the event of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra is only an event in history that doesn't have anything to do with our beliefs. We answer that. We say that approving an incident in history or denying it sometimes it's really related and connected to our beliefs, and sometimes you cannot even separate between them. For example, if someone comes up and excuses the usurping of the leadership after the Prophet ﷺ from Amir al Mu'mineen, ignoring that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assigned Imam Ali alayhi salam in Ghadir Khum, and people congratulated him. The same people who usurped the leadership, they congratulated him. Would his excuse be acceptable? Of course not. Why? Because if Imam Ali السلام, was in his place, of course the worldly place, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assigned him, a lot of bloodshed would have been avoided. A lot of invasions that happened without a permission from the Prophet 
or from the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth would have been avoided. And these invasions that led after to a lot of slaves, the, the, the increase of amount in slaves. All of this would have been avoided. This, of course, this is 1% of the things that can, could be avoided. It has a very strong relation with the beliefs. A lot of people would have been not deviated. Let's say as well, if someone comes up and excuses Yazid for murdering Imam Hussein alayhi salam, would his excuse be acceptable? Of course not. Same goes for Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. If it's only an event in history, why would the Prophet cry for it years before it happened? Why would Ahlul Bayt and the Imams cry for it all the time? Imam al kadhim when he mentions the narration, Allah, when the Prophet said, Allah inna Fatima babuha babi. Fatima, her door is my door, and her hijab is my hijab. And then he cried for so long. After he stopped, he said, Hutika wallah, hijab Allah. The hijab of Allah has been compromised. He said it twice, and he cried. It was said that Sayyid Baqir al-Hindi, he saw Imam Sahib al-Asr wal-Zaman, Ajallah ta'ala Faraj al-Sharif, in the dream, on the night of Eid al-Ghadir, he saw him crying. He said, are you crying, O Master? And this is a night of joy. This is the night of the Eid. Then the Imam said, لا تران اتخذت لا وعلاها بعد بيت الأحزان بيت السروري. After the martyrdom of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, the house of joy for me, for me is the house of, tra of, this, of sorrow that Imam Ali السلام, built for Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, sallallahu wa sallam. In addition to that, all of the religions and our religion with its beliefs and jurisprudence is a historical event. All the narrations that we derive our rulings from are narrated by the Prophet and the Imams 1400 years ago. So if it's only an incident in the history, we'd have just, we just leave it and we ignore it? Of course not. So it's not only an event in history and it has nothing to do with our beliefs. Another question that they would ask, they would say, even one of the knowledgeable scholars from our sect, he said that, of course, there was as well worldly purposes. They say that at the time of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, they removed the door and they kept only a curtain. There wasn't even a door. Why would you say that the door was burnt and there wasn't even a door, there was a curtain? Before going to the narration that proves the opposite, let's talk about it logically. What is the role of a door? The door is used to protect you, secure your house, cover you from others. And if you really want to use the door wisely, every time you enter your house, you lock the door before you sleep. You lock the door. Otherwise, if you don't want to lock the door, use anything other than the door, than the door that covers. So the role of the door is not only to cover, it's as well to prevent uh, thieves, for example, from entering your house. So Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayha, why would she use a curtain? And she's the daughter of the Prophet. She's the one that teaches the people about hijab. Isn't that a less level of hijab for her house? Of course it is. So it's impossible for Sayyidah Zahra to have only a curtain on her door. Kids might enter. Like that blind person who came once to the door of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, he would have entered without even knowing that he, there was a door. The narrations that we find in our books and in the books of the other sect, they talk about a door that was on the house of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, like the hadith of Sadd al-Abwab. When the Prophet ﷺ built the mosque in Medina, he built nine houses for his wives. And in these houses, there was door that connects this house to the masjid and another door that leads to the street. And after, after a while, the companions built their houses the same way. In the year the third of Al-Hijrah, the Prophet was ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to seal all the doors but the door of Ali, alayhi salam, the house of Ali. And this narration is in both sects. You can find it. It's called Hadith Sadd al-Abwab. So, some of the companions came to the Prophet, why did you close all the doors and sealed all the doors, but the door of Ali ibn Abi Talib? He said, Wallah, it's not me who sealed your doors and left the door of Imam Ali alayhi salam open to the mosque. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did that. Allah let you out and he kept him in. So, and we say in dua al-nudba, wa sadda al-abwaba illa baba. 
So there was a door on the house of Sayyidina Fatima al-Zahra. Even if we want to say that there was a curtain, there wouldn't be a need to bring a wood or a bundle of, of, of wood to put it. You need a small fire to ignite the curtain. But in their book, they say, even, even, even it's mentioned in their poems, Hafiz Ibrahim is one of the poets, the Egyptian poets. He says, وَقَوْلَةٌ لِعَلِيٍّ قَالَهَا عُمَرُ أَكْرِمْ بِسَامِعِهَا أَعْظِمْ بِمُلْقِيهَا and a saying that Umar said to Ali, and he says, praise highly the one who listened, who, he who heard that word, and glorify the one who said it. They respect both. What did he say? In the poem he said it, and he's a Sunni. He says, حَرَّقْتُ دَارَكَ لَا أُبْقِي عَلَيْكَ بِهَا إِن لَمْ تُبَايَعْ وَبِنْتُ الْمُصْطَفَى فِيهَا I will burn your house if you don't come out and pledge allegiance, even if Sayyidina Fatima is Zahra in the house. So they admit that at least they threatened the house of Sayyidina Fatima al-Zahra, salawatullahi wa salam alayhi. So, a small fire would have been enough. Why would he bring bundles of wood to the house of Sayyidina Fatima al-Zahra, salawatullahi wa salam alayhi. So when we read the narrations, da'a bin nar fa'adramaha bil bab, he called upon the fire to light, to ignite the door. And then he says, when Sayyidina Zahra alayhi salam said, aturaka muharriqan alayya babi, are you going to burn my door? So all of these narrations, they prove that the house of Sayyidina Fatima al-Zahra had a door on. Another question that they bring up as well, they would say, these people used to love Sayyidina Fatima al-Zahra. How would they harm her? Depending on some narrations that they say that they came to her house and they said salam. But of course, in their narrations, they said that she didn't respond. And they said, you know that you are more precious to us than our daughters. They claim that if you love someone, if you love someone, would you, hear, would you take their land? Why did they take Fadak from Sayyidina Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam? What did they even threaten the house of Sayyidina Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam? This is, if you want to show someone love, you don't do that. You don't do these actions. And some of smart people as well, they say, why would Sayyidina Zahra alayhi salam respond to the door? How, did, how does she face the men? Isn't Ali alayhi salam in the house? Of course, this is a question. If you think about it, it's, it's a logical question. But we say that Zahra alayhi salam, Sayyidina Fatima Zahra, didn't face the men. She didn't go to open the door. She, they, at, they came to her door. 300 people from Bani Sulaim came with these people who gathered in Saqifah to her house. Just imagine this amount of people, they're going to have a big noise. They came to her house, scaring the kids, threatening to, put, to burn the house, because she had the chance to defend Imam Ali alayhi salam. How? Because before she's the wife of Imam Ali alayhi salam, she's a follower of the Prophet. I have a role towards the Imam of my time. She had to defend him any way possible. She knows that the Prophet, in more than one incident, in more than... Uh, one time he said to them that Fatima is a piece of me whoever harms her, harms me whoever angers her, angers me and whoever angers me, angers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so she came to tell them that I'm here, have respect to me have respect to my father but they didn't care about that, so she didn't go to open the door she, she went to inform them that I am in the house and you heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, said that about me and they would say why didn't Amir al muminin answer them isn't he the man in the house and a very close question to that some people they want to prove the importance of unity they say that Imam Ali salam, did not pull his sword just for the sake of unity that's not true first of all Imam Ali salam, didn't answer the door why and Sayyidina Zara had to be the one who answered the door. Why? Because Imam Ali salam, if he opened the door, he has two options. Either he pledges allegiance to them or he doesn't. If he does, it's as if he admitted that they are the rightful heirs to the leadership. And that's not right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him. And in the Quran, when the Prophet prepared the people, when the verse says, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا 
that your leader is Allah and his prophet and those the faithful ones who are the faithful ones alladhina yuqimuna as-salata wa yu'tuna az-zakata wa hum raki'un those who perform salat and they give out the zakat while they are in ruku' and salat and this the only all the tafsir not only us they admit that imam ali alayhi salam is the only one who gave the khatam and even the verse was, was received by the prophet before he entered the mosque and he saw the beggar beggar coming out having the ring that he took from imam ali alayhi salam so either he pledged allegiance to them and as if he admitted that they are the rightful heirs to the throne or he doesn't and if he doesn't they would try to affect on him by force and if they take him by force and a lot of people they're not going to know the the, um, the 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 oppression and the the effect of that incident if that happened if they took if he if they if they forced him to pledge allegiance a lot of people they would uh, the truth wouldn't be clear for them but when say the zahra alayhi salam answered the door she ruined their plans why because when the second was ordered by the first to bring the allegiance of Amir al-Mu'minin by force. It means, like, don't worry about whoever stands up in your face. You have to get it. Because if you don't get it, as if you didn't do anything. So when, the, when Sayyidina Zahra stood up and they were ordered to bring the allegiance by force and they did what they did, that's how the people knew how big the oppression was. So she ruined the plans. That's why when she hid between the door and the wall, he knew that the only one to support Amir al-Mu'mineen on that day, that Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, and he said, if I remove her from the way, everything will be easy for us. So they attacked the house of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam and they burned the door. Part of the door was burnt, the door went open, and the people attacked the house. Sayyidina Zahra alayhi salam saw that the people are in the heart of her house. She didn't have the chance to go back to her room. She went behind the door in order to, to seek hijab. al the second one, he felt her behind the door. And he said, if we remove Sayyidina Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam from the way, there is no support for Amir al muminin on that day since they had 300 people surrounding the house of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam in order to prevent anyone from supporting them. So he says in the message that he sent to Muawiyah that his son showed to Yazid after the martyrdom of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He said, when I felt Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra hidden behind the door, I put the other foot on the other side of the door, and my back on the door, and I started to push. And I heard, when I heard her scream, I felt that the Medina is upside down and I didn't remove my back from the door till I heard the ribs of Fatima break. Say the Fatima to Zara alayhi salam in that situation behind the door going through that pain. The narrations mention that she had three calls. The first call she said, Oh Father, Oh Muhammad, look at us, what we faced after your absence, after your martyrdom. The second call of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra was for Fidda, her servant, her assistant. When she fell on the ground, she said, Oh Fidda, take me to your chest. Let me lean on your chest. I swear by the name of Allah that my fetus, that they killed my fetus. They killed my baby al muhsin some of the khutaba he says that her third call was for Imam Sahib al Asr al Zaman. She said, Oh son, oh Mahdi, when are you going to come back? 
and avenge me. This call stays unanswered till the reappearance of Sahib al Asri was Zaman when he comes to Medina and he screams, Ya Lithara Jaddati Fatima, Sayyidi Gumu Khalil Rawayam Nasharaya, Waslub al Jibti. من فوق شجرة وصيح ظل عمي الزارش كسر من غصاب حقها يا وهاج حزانها كيف من بعد لطمة العين يا ابن طه تهنا بطرف قرير يا We ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى by the name of Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra, by her broken ribs, to hasten the reappearance of Sahib al Asri wa Zaman and to grant us the tawfiq to be of his supporters and the defenders of the religion and the avengers of Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra. السلام, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure the ill and to give us our needs in this dunya and the mercy and the forgiveness in the hereafter. And Wali Qada al Hawaj, Wali Shifa al Marda, Wali Tajil Faraj al Mona Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, Wali Kabur al Ahmad, Wali Arwahamwat al Mu'minin, Wali Mu'minat, Ashwada, Wali Ulama, Nuhd al Jamia, Thawab Ma Qarana, Thawab al Mubarakat al Fatiha, Masbukat al Salati ala Muhammad, Wali Muhammad.